important. The CV, if you ever looked in, into the internet, is so crazy of competitiveness. I, I don't know where to start. I, I could start with just naming the honorary doctorates uh, uh, from the University of Naples, of Macerata, of Tiflis, of Lund University, and so forth. The time he spent at the Wissenschaftskolleg, Max Weber lecture. It is so long and it's really a little bit of a, a, a crazy CV. Why couldn't you make it a little bit easier for me? And uh, so School of Economics and Political Science, it is a kind of a who is a, an institutional who is who in the world. And uh, so, so much the more we are really glad that you come to us and we know in the same time that you are very, very uh, modest uh, person uh, as a personality and this may even be found in your last work. I can't name and I won't name all the important publications you have done in the field of the theory of law, the sociology of law and all the prizes you won in this field. But I would like to talk about the last book that may also be related to the topic of today. Verfassungsfragmente. How modest the title is to speak about fragments when we have constitutionalism as a cultural idea that embraces the whole world and uh, uh, fragments that come from a romantic tradition as I said but where you put a very 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 strong point by saying we have to take the concept of verfassung of constitution much more seriously because it goes the notion of verfassung that's the starting one of your starting points goes beyond just the constitution of the state the institutional arrangements and even goes beyond individual human rights and so forth it means much more but what does it mean and how to bring those fragments to, uh, together where I would have liked to give another title to your book as I said yesterday Fragment d'un discours constitutionnel <laughs> so that's your uh, way now to uh, to tell us how you bring together externalizing normativities mm -hmm. and uh, constitutional context okay. thank you thank you very much I think you forgot one thing uh, to tell about me. That you're I'm, a tourist, yes. No, no, that I'm an Aussie, and an Aussie is not an Australian. Uh, th this explains perhaps also the fragment character. Um, Jean Paul, a uh, famous, a bit weird German poet of the 19th century, once said, um, Witz is das Bemerken uh, der Verbindung zwischen entfernten Ideen. Witz, so wit is not quite the tra uh, translation, but wit is to, rem to, to, to perceive the connection between different, very distant ideas, very distant ideas. And I want to be witty, so uh, what I want to make is to establish a connection between four remarkable but rather distant phenomena whose interpretation is subject to considerable uncertainty. The first remarkable phenomenon is that judge-made law is now expanding drastically also in transnational contexts. It was all already offensive enough in the nation state that the courts, which are after all la bouche de la loi, produced more and more legal norms on their own, yet now we find that this trend is continuing unfettered and even accelerating in transnational regime. First. Second, it has recently been possible to observe a striking return of natural law. While philosophers, historians, and legal theorists have always said, well, there's the demise of natural law, jurisprudence scholars and some judges have been celebrating the resurrection of arguments grounded in natural law. And this is not only in the sustained boom of fundamental and human rights. Third phenomenon is a change in direction among protest movements, which some observers interpret as the implementation of a new political quality. The conflicts in which these changes have been found are Brent Spa, the World Social Forum, Golim, Animal Rights Protest, uh, Company Sucks, 
Com, Stuttgart 21, Wikileaks, the Indian Yadis in Occupy Wall Street. So the common denominator is that these civil society protests are addressed not only against the state, but also selectively and purposefully against the organized professional institutions of the economy and of other functional systems that they hold responsible for seriously distorted developments. And the fourth remarkable phenomenon is the greatly different status of various types of constitutions. The state constitution, the economic constitution, and the constitution of science, for example. So the dominance, if not exactly the monopoly of state constitutions, is obvious, both in practice and in theory. The status of economic constitution is already more precarious, and the existence of the constitution of science is really maintained only in a metaphorical sense. So why do social subsystems have such different constitutional status? So these are the four distant phenomena. Now what's the connection? So my thesis is how a constitution deals with its foundational paradox. This is the point that links these four reciprocally separate phenomena together. So the point is not restricted to the state constitution alone, but it's also applicable to the constitution of other social systems. Starting point, the incurable starting point, is Niklas Luhmann's theory of the state constitution, which gives a central role how law and politics are dealing with their original paradoxes. As the law is founded on the binary code of right and wrong, it gets into a tangle when the code is inevitably applied to itself in the paradoxes of self-reference. This foundational paradox of law exposes the law to the suspicion of arbitrariness, undermines its quest for legitimacy, and paralyzes decisions. And in the end, only one strategy of deep paradoxification has been found to be successful in the past, law, externalizes its paradox to our politics with the aid of the state constitution. In this way, the law seeks its ultimate legitimation in democratic politics, is thus disburdened of its own problems of paradox and no longer needs to concern itself with how politics comes to terms with externalization. Politics, on the other hand, has to struggle with an internally insoluble paradox, the paradox of the binding of necessarily unbound authority, or the paradox of sovereignty. How could one bind the sovereign to rational rules and above all to his own promises? This was only facilitated when it was externalized to the law, which once again was accomplished by the state constitution. So the constitution commits politically unconstrained sovereignty to the processes of law. So the state constitution can be seen as a structural coupling between the law and politics, and it's characterized by the fact that there is a reciprocal externalization of the original paradoxes of politics and law. Now, my question, is it possible to generalize this theory of the political constitution? Do other social systems externalize their paradoxes toward the law and vice versa in such a way that alongside the state constitution, other subsystem constitutions, the economic constitution, a media constitution, organizational constitutions, also act as instrument of practical paradox management? So let's first talk about the deep paradoxifications of law. Again, the state constitution. Externalizing the legal paradoxes toward the political system of the nation state was such a success story in the past that until the end of the 20th century, it was advanced not only in constitutional <coughs> law, but across the board in all fields of law. It already becomes, became obvious in the nation state that the total externalization of legal paradoxes toward the political system would end up uh, overburdening both the law and politics. The overpoliticization of law thus this unleashed demonstrated disintegrating effects. 
Externalization became almost impossible when transnational regimes began to create their own law. Rulemaking outside the framework of international law that occurs so massively all over the globe reopens all the problems of the legal paradox which had been encountered in the nation state before they had been successfully transferred to politics. So globalization, in a sense, reopens the paradoxes of, of law. Now, social constitution. In, this, in the quest for alternative ways to cope with the legal paradox, the law seems to react by forcing an internal differentiation into legal subsectors. But then, <laughs> instead of orienting these subsectors on criteria internal to the law, it bypasses the political system and bases its norm production on other social systems. This is already apparent in the nation state when semi-autonomous subsectors of the law, such as economic law, labor law, social law, medical law, media law, and science law, evolve rig vigorously, undermining the traditional separation of public law and private law. Although these special legal fields officially preserve the externalization of law toward politics, they actually reduce it progressively in a surreptitious manner, shifting the paradox of forming norms into, away from politics, but into the regulated social system. So the law's internal differentiation is promoted even more radically at the transnational level. Diverse social fields are governed by highly specialized legal regimes, the famous fragments, that are to a considerable ex extent detached from public international law and now coupled closely with the inner rationality of the social fields involved. Public regimes, such like the World Trade Organization, that have come into being as treaties in international law, marginalized the paradox externalization to politics that had been initially present in their contact to international law. In private regimes, such as the Lex Mercatoria, the Lex Sportiva, or the Lex Digitalis, the original paradoxes of these transnational legal orders are displaced from the very outset into the social fields with which they have entered into a close symbiosis. Since the application of the legal code to itself not only introduces the abstract question of law's legitimation, kind of founding myth, which is no longer answered with the legislator's will, but more probably with the inner rationality of the social subsystems involved, so the law it changes not only the founding myth, where it conceals its paradox, but looks for a different constitutional foundation of its norm production. If it's now no longer the state constitution that is enlisted for externalizing paradoxes, but the constitutions of social subsectors, so of the economy, the media, science, and healthcare, then there are immediate tangible consequences when the legal paradox is transformed other processes of norm production move into the foreground and a different kind of substantive legal norms come into force. So the once dominant lawmaking process, which translates collective political decisions into legal norms, is to a considerable extent being replaced in transnational regimes by social norm production that is transformed into applicable law. Contract, formal organization and standardization are the three great jurisgenerative processes whereby the self-made rules of the economy but also of science, education, the media and healthcare becomes valid law. Now let's move to the protest movements. This is where we find the explanation why protest movements are changing their addressees. They react to the change of externalizing the paradoxes of law. They no longer address state authorities as the target of their protest, but transnational corporations or other social institutions. Protest movements change the direction of their attacks whenever the legal system engages political legislation only for its formal legitimation and turns to contract, formal organization, and standardization. Constitutionalism from below. This is the headline under which the protest movement's contribution to constitutionalism is discussed today. A series of others 
James Tully, Antonio Negri, Gavin Anderson, have observed that the transnational pouvoir constituant cannot be found in the political institutions, but is now manifested in social movements. That is, in the multitude or in a variety of protest movements in NGOs and in transnational segments of the public. Anderson identifies such a transnational constitutionalism from below in the, quote, constituent powers found both within and outside the structures of representative democracy, the latter comprising decolonization and internationalist <coughs> movements, alternative NGOs and bodies which escape traditional categorization such as the World Social Forum. Quote end. This means that the most celebrated phenomenon of constitutions, the pouvoir constituant, is no longer the all-embracing demos, but just fragmented processes in, trans in transnational relations, it's crystal clear that there is no such thing as a constitutional dynamic that embraces world society as a whole, but that what we have at the most is a series of heterogeneous processes of constitutionalization. This gives up the traditional notion in which the political constitution provides the, po the collective energies of a society as a whole with a form that encapsulates it in the past as a nation or now as the international community. Instead, modern society's collective potential is no longer available as a unity, but is increasingly compartmentalized in the multiplicity of social potentials, energies, and strengths. So law will then no longer seek its legitimation primarily through the political constitution, but through sectorial constitutions. Now let's move to the other phenomenon, judge-made law. This now illustrates how the expansion of judge-made law relates to the externalizing paradoxes. Judge-made law is now beginning to play an unprecedented role. It is no longer just producing self-referentially the rules of the case law in litigation so as to solve individual conflicts. It now also takes on board the social norms produced by contract organization and standardization deriving from this different form of legitimation that is no longer le legal nor political but social. Now, case law takes over a genuine constitutional function. However, it does not derive its norm from the state constitution, which is only a partial constitution, but from the constitution of various social subsystems. This comes, of course, most clearly in one of the most important 20th century institutions of private law in the legal control of standard contracts. Remember this? the small print stuff which we never read, but we are always exposed to it, right? Also on the internet. So under, under the guise of contracting, under the guise of contracting, markets have developed authoritative private regulations that no longer govern an individual contractual relationship, but have practically all the characteristics of general legislation. Judge-made law now reacted to these privately imposed norms by taking on a dual constitutional role. On the one hand, it legitimates this form of one-sided norm pro production backed by economic power, whose problem it downplays by labeling it still contractual. It uses secondary rules to uh, regulate private norm uh, production. On the other hand, the courts intervene wholesale with strict judicial reviews in the economy's self-made law, whose intensity is on a par with the constitutional reviews exercised on political legislation. Oh, you see the parallel. Oh, standardized contracts are nothing but private regulation of markets, oh, quite similar to general legislation. And here we find suddenly a new the legal hierarchy of higher norms and the courts controlling via higher norms this uh, rule production. Judge-made law plays a comparable role in other social areas when it subjects norm production in all sorts of social organizations based on private law, hospitals, universities, trade unions, professional associations, media concerns, and recently internet intermediaries to a comprehensive legal review. 
Here too, it fulfills the dual constitutional function just mentioned, on the one hand, normalizing the procedures of social normation through quasi-contract, on the other, checking the substantive norms of internal organizational law for unconstitutionality. On the global scale, law can externalize its paradox toward politics within, only within extremely narrow confines. Instead, various transnational regimes uh, own constitutions cause the regime law's original paradoxes to disappear as they relocate them into their respective social systems. The paradigm here is, again, the Lex Mercatoria, which gives form to contrat sans loi, something which is almost impossible in the law. How can you have contract without the backing of law, right? So this is to free-floating contracts without any extra contractual foundation. This evident paradox can no longer be accommodated in the law of the nation state. In a remarkable circularity, it relies on courts of arbitration that it has created itself to produce not only material norms, but also higher ranking constitutional norms. Right? Next phenomenon, natural law. There's a clear connection between alternative ways of externalizing paradoxes in natural law, long believed to be moribund, which is now celebrating its resurrection in specialized fields of law and in the transnational legal regimes. When judge-made law gives force to higher ranking constitutional norms, it derives its criteria from the internal rationality of social subsystems, efficiency, for example, as a legal principle, the functionality of social organizations, the self-definition of art uh, as a legal principle, the neutrality and objectivity of science, the educational mission of the schools and universities, and the network adequacy of internal and internet norms, such formula are constantly flowing into legal practice from the various different social systems and are transformed into legal principles by judge-made law, then giving force as concrete legal rules. So the constitutions, they are constructed as material constitutions as opposed to formal ones because they contain not only formal procedural rules but also substantive norms and principles. There's only one way to explain their highly problematic natural law character today. It is not the legal system, but the social system that decides in the course of lengthy conflicts about certain fundamental principles which are then constructed by constitutional law juridically and at the same time altered for legal purposes. Not only the political system, but similarly other social systems in their own reflection politics develop fundamental principles that are then legally reconstructed in the economic constitution, in the constitution of science, etc., and are used as criteria for the judicial reviews of norms. So the continuity of the natural law thinking is perceptible here. Natural law has always been used to make the paradoxes of self-reference in the legal code to disappear. Uh, the validity cultures, uh, they are you know, ways how to conceal the legal paradox. Unlike the old natural law whose origin were religious, rationalist, or political, it is today feasible to talk in terms of a sociological natural law. Sociological natural law, because it uses societal constitutions to reconstruct the rationalities of diverse subsystems within the legal system and transform them into binding principles. So, so far, on the way how the law is dealing, concealing, changing, shifting, dislocating its paradox no longer only to politics but to other social areas. Now let's look in the other direction. How does it look in other social systems? Do other social areas also experience reciprocal externalization so that they in turn cede their original paradoxes to the law? Let's start again with the state constitution. If politics has become independent since the Renaissance, uh, Machiavelli and so on, if it has broken free of religious bonds, if it has ultimately become sovereign and declared itself to be legibus absoluta, 
then the sovereignty paradox, the paradox of the binding of necessarily unbound authority comes to the fore in all its poignancy. It is the state constitution that enables politics to master this paradox by displacing it outwards. Politics transfers to the law the task of constraining unconstrained sovereignty, especially by procedural rules, by means of legal procedures, by means of organization as the inner bond and of fundamental rights for constraining arbitrariness toward the outside. Now let's look to other constitutions, the economic constitution. What role does the law play when the economy has to cope with its own fundamental paradox? the paradox of scarcity. This paradox paralyzes economic action in such a way that acquisition of finite goods does away with scarcity while at the same time generating scarcity. In the past, the only way to overcome this blockage was by replacing the scarcity paradox with a clear-cut binary code of property, non-property. But that presumes that every act of economic acquisition is sufficiently strict about condensing vaguely understood positions of having and not having into durable positions of property, non-property. According to Luhmann, this condensation has played a key role in rendering the economy autonomous. Condensing social position into binding certainties cannot be achieved by acts of economic acquisition alone, however. At the most, such acts can generate diffuse social expectations in this direction, but cannot shape them strictly enough to achieve a precarious de-paradoxification within three dimensions. In the temporal dimensions, property expectation must establish solid bonds that will last for a long time. In the social dimension, they must establish the unambiguous inclusion-exclusion of the group of people concerned, which causes considerable difficulties, especially in the case of collective property. And in the substantive dimension, they must generate clearly defined clusters of expectation with regard, with regard to rights of use, rights of exclusivity, rights of exploitation, and rights of acquisition and their respective borderlines. This can only be achieved by a highly developed legal system, so it is the constitution of property that generates a close structural coupling between the economy and the law, and in practice it, it externalizes the scarcity paradox in the law of property. Now, as soon as a highly developed monetary economy takes shape, and especially as soon as banks specialize in credit activities, the economic constitution <coughs> enters a second phase in which the scarcity paradox takes on a completely different form. Deparadoxification then correspondingly runs on different tracks. And here the economy again externalizes the paradox which threatens to paralyze monetary transaction toward the law in the banking sector, both the ability and the inability to, play, to pay are generated simultaneously. The banking system is based on the paradox of self-reference, on the unity of the ability and inability to pay. And this paradox can be mitigated, uh, can never be resolved, but mitigate to a, certain, to a certain extent if the payment operations take on a reflexive mode. That is, if operations involving quantities of money are applied to money operations in daily transactions. Uh, the central banks. However, these reflexive economic operations remain unstable until an internal hierarchy is created within the banking sector, the hierarchy of central banks in their relation to commercial banks. Uh, yet the banking hierarchy cannot be institutionalized exclusively via self-regulation, and this applies in particular to the institutionalization of the central banks. It needs to be supported from the outside by legal rules in order to constitute the unique position of the central bank with binding regulation. So the parallels with the hierarchies of the political system and the role of the state constitutions are evident. The economy too only copes with its monetary paradox with the help of the law, which uses the financial constitutions that is norm of procedures of competence of organizations to regulate the establishment and operating methods of the central banks vis-a-vis -vis the commercial banks. 
As an economic corollary to the different branches of government, the executive, the legislator, and the judiciary, now we have the monetative, the monetative, uh, the fourth branch of the central banks is established by the economic constitution. The fact that politics externalize the sovereignty paradox, while in parallel the economy externalized the scarcity paradox, both towards the law, and that in this way the state constitution and the economic constitution fulfill the same function is quite astonishing. And yet, major differences are conspicuous. As for monetary operations within the economy, there is no sign of the complete secondary coding that forces the political system to apply the binary code legal illegal to all political operations. There are basically three reasons for this. Firstly, there is no doubt that the economic transactions are regulated by legal norms, but the intense relation between political and legal operations do, does not find a counterpart in the relation between monetary and legal operations. To be sure, economic transactions are valid, valid, only under certain contractual conditions, yet in practice economic transactions are the diametric opposite of the implementation of existing norms. Secondly, while the juridification of political decisions further strengthens their collectively binding character, it would be simply counterproductive for economic action if individual transactions were collectively binding for the whole economy. Only on the micro level is it possible to talk in terms of a secondary legal coding of economic transaction in the form of contractual acts or cooperative acts. Thirdly, the ongoing concatenation of political and economic operations differs one fundamentally from the other. Political decisions have precedential effects on subsequent decisions. If it intends to deviate from them, politics has to go through the entire legal procedure once again, and the deviating decision must be rendered positive with an explicit, explicit actus contrarius. Future monetary transactions, on the contrary, are by no means bound normatively by the previous transaction. Instead, the individual act of payment generates nothing but cognitive expectations for subsequent acts of payment. So far for the economic constitution, now let's, let's look to science, constitution of science. This, this asymmetry of externalization, uh, strong externalization of law toward politics or the economy, rather weak, ex strong externalization of politics toward law, but rather weak externalization of the economy towards law is now different again, is even more marked in the constitution <coughs> of science. To be sure, science also has its paradox of self-foundation. Only scientific operations can determine reflexively what actually constitutes science. So the validity culture of science. The Cretan paradox, which derives from applying cognitive operations to cognitive uh, operations. You remember the Cretan liar? Uh, said, I'm a Cretan, all Cretans are liars, uh, so am I lying or not, is probably the best known case of a self-referential paradox. But unlike politics and the economy, it is mostly impossible to externalize the scientific paradox towards the law, normative stipulations which are legally or constitutionally binding and which can be changed only with difficulties are self-destructive for science. It would actually be absurd to interpret cognitive acts as the implementation of rules. Admittedly, even though it portrays itself as undogmatic, non-dogmatic, science too is no stranger to extensive norm production. Methods are binding, theories are immunized normatively against a change of paradigm, neutrality, objectivity, and immunity to interests are accepted professional norms. And yet, the juridification of such no social norms would generate a paralysis irreconcilable with the cognitive style. So unlike politics and the economy, science cannot pass its paradox on to the law, but has to seek out other ways to achieve the deparadoxification. It finds them mainly in processes internal to science itself, temporalizing the paradox creating a hierarchy of different levels of analysis, enduring contradictions, antinomies, and incommensurabilities, tolerating uncertainty, relinquishing the compulsions to decide, 
creating a constructivist worldview. These are some of the tools used by science in the attempt to make its paradox more bearable. That does not mean, however, that there can be no such thing as a constitution of science, in which scientific and legal reflexivity are coupled together structurally. It is just the internal asymmetry, the internal asymmetry of their coupling is extremely strongly developed. Only its externally borders, external borders should be protected by legal norms, freedom of science as a guarantee that the cognitive process remains open, thus becomes the sole norm of the scientific constitution. So, come to an end. Altogether then, societal constitutionalism, as exemplified here by politics, the economy and science, paints a picture of constitutional pluralism, although one that is anything but uniform, since it realizes different degrees of intensities of constitutionalization. It depends on the affinity, on the affinity between their own structures and the specific normativity developed within the legal system, whether they will follow or not the path of externalizing completely towards the law, as politics chose to do with the legal secondary codification of its operation, or whether they will opt, like the economy, only for a partial externalization towards the law, or whether, like science, they will rule out a juridification of their operations and adopt other possible methods of deparadoxification. So this shows why the state constitutions occupies a unique position among social constitutions. This position certainly does not derive from the state's constitutional monopoly, as state-centric constitutional lawyers would have us believe, since other disciplines like historiography, econom economics, sociology, and international relations have long demonstrated the existence of non-state constitutions. Rather, the reciprocal externalization of politics toward the law and of law toward politics is totally symmetrical. This is responsible for the unique position of state constitution, this intense relation. Structural couplings are generally misunderstood and social constitution in particular when it is said that structural couplings only exist as reciprocal, as fully reciprocal relations. Indeed, it is quite possible for one social system like the law, to be closely coupled to another, while the latter system in its operations is only partly coupled or largely foregoes a structural coupling. It is like love. Often it is only experienced on one side, and only in a handful of lucky cases it is truly reciprocated by the person who is loved. Thank you. <laughs>